Alright, yeah, and welcome back to some more Magic Jewels. This week, we're going to take a look at an Enchantments deck, a Green-White Angelic Revolt deck, as it were. Uh, this is actually partially an inspiration from a subscriber deck that one of you guys sent me, Ray Basato. This is kind of your deck, and also kind of mine. Uh, I ran out of ideas, really. Not very inspired at the moment in terms of new deck builds, so I ended up going with a very lovely-looking deck that you built. But I wanted to sort of spice it up myself because I like to rotate between decks that I've had impact on and decks that are entirely your decks. So this is kind of a 50-50 thing. Uh, Ray's version was entirely enchantment focused. Mine's actually spiced up with a little bit of revolt as well. So there's a lot of revolt stuff in here. But it's also heavily focused around um, playing enchantments as well. So we've got our Sigil of the Empty Throne which was the old win condition. But... Uh, with this kind of build with Aid from the Cowl and stuff like that, um, we can really get out of hand. I'll get to Aid from the Cowl in a bit because it's kind of interesting. It's the first deck that has done something like this for me anyway. Anyway, let's go to the beginning of the deck, shall we? We've got Unbridled Growth. So for one green mana, we've got two copies of this. It's an Enchantment Aura. It says Enchant Land. Enchanted Land has add one mana of any colour to your mana pool. And you can sacrifice it to draw a card. So the primary focus of this card is to engage revolt for us. So we play it on a land and we sack it immediately. So a permanent leaving the battlefield triggers revolt essentially. So if we can sack the unbridled growth, trigger revolt and then maybe we use one of our revolt cards like a renegade rallier that says you can bring cards back with uh, pop converted mana cost two or less. So we either bring back a land or we bring back the unbridled growth so that we can do it again. That kind of thing. So, triggers revolt, but it also helps us sort out our mana if we ever do get a little bit screwed on the colours that we have available. We can add one mana of any colour to our mana pool in order to fix that. It's also a one mana aura, and that's quite important as we'll go to here. Sram, Senior Edificer. So, for one and a Y, a 2 2 legendary creature. Whenever you cast an aura, equipment, or vehicle spell, draw a card. Most people have been playing this in vehicles, but this one for us is actually kind of aura focused. A lot of our enchantments are auras. Um, more specifically, the build around card, the reason this deck exists is because of Conviction, which we'll get to in a second. Um, and there's a nice little combo here. There's lots of synergies, lots of combos with everything in the deck, which is why I really like how it's, uh, how it's turned out. But yeah, Sram Senior Edifice, so whenever you cast an aura, equipment or vehicle spell, draw a card. So every single one of our enchantments when Sram is down is actually a card draw spell. This combos very nicely with Conviction. Conviction is a 1 and a white enchantment aura. It says enchant creature, so once we do that we draw a card from Sram. It gives the enchanted creature plus 1 plus 3, but we can also pay a white and return Conviction from to its owner's hand. So we bounce it from the battlefield and return it to our hand. If it's back to our hand, it allows us to recast it, so the cast trigger goes off on Sram again and we draw a card. So this is repeatable card draw in a nutshell, but it's also a repeatable revolt, because when Conviction leaves the battlefield, it triggers revolt. So we can use our revolt cards uh, fairly consistently, things like Solemn Recruit at the beginning of your end step. If a permanent you control left the battlefield, you get to put a 1-1 counter on it, that kind of thing. So we want to trigger this every single turn. Conviction allows us to do that. As long as we have a creature on the battlefield, we can play Conviction and we can bounce Conviction and that will trigger Revolt. Three mana to do that every single turn or even two mana if we have Herald of the Pantheon. Herald of the Pantheon says one and a green for a 2-2 two -two creature. Enchantment spells you cast cost one colorless less to cast. And whenever you cast an enchantment spell, you gain one life. So we cut all of the enchantments down uh, by half in some cases. So Nimbus Wings, you take that one colourless off and that's how much it costs. It costs one white mana to do that. So if we have both of these on the battlefield, it costs one white mana for a conviction to gain a life and draw a card. And then it costs one white mana to get it back, to cast it again, gain a life, draw a card, that kind of thing. We'll just completely, uh, consistently do that over and over again. Um, conviction does have a lot of synergies as well, other than these two, and we'll get to those shortly. Conviction is the build around card, so it's got a lot of things it can do. Next, we've got Sylvan Advocate. So for one and a green, a 2-3 with Vigilance. It says as long as you control six or more lands, Sylvan Advocate and land creatures you control get plus two, plus two. Now, this isn't really a synergistic card in the deck, but it is a good value two drop creature, which can be grabbed with our Revolt cards, like Renegade Rally, I can grab it back, that kind of thing. But it's also a 2-3 that can be turned into a 3-6 with Conviction, 
which makes it just unblockable in certain cases. Like, you can block it all you want, but you're not going to kill it, that kind of thing. And then when it gets plus two, plus two, it gets really out of hand yet again. So, like, Renegade Rallyer can pull back Sylvan Advocate and get a 4-5 for two mana, essentially, which is pretty sweet. But Sylvan Advocate is mostly there just as a target for our auras and just as a nice value creature on the top, turn two. We then have Nimbus Wings, so for one and a white, an enchantment aura. Enchanted creature has plus one, plus two, and flying. So we can get over the top with any of our creatures this way. We can stick it on Sylvan Advocate and make it a three, five, vigilant flyer. That kind of thing, so we can block everything yet again. We're only running two copies because we do have ways to grab it, and we also have Angelic Destiny as well. So that's all we need. And plus, um, Renegade Rallyer can grab back Nimbus Wings um, because it is two converted mana costs, but it cannot grab back the Angelic Destiny. So we kind of do really want those flyers in the air because it allows us to get past our opponent with our big creatures. Sticking a Nimbus Wings on a Solemn Recruit, for example, will make it a 3-4 double striker and it'll still get bigger from the revolt as well if we can trigger that so it's pretty sweet only running two copies because they are uh, fetchable with uh, cards in our deck but uh, they're also returnable as well with our renegade rallies so we've spoken about conviction this is the build around card makes the whole deck work but it works without it as well which is really really good thing for a deck to have a build around card that's not essential but is very much a benefit we then have Bygone Bishop, so for two and a white, we have a 2-3 flyer. It says whenever you cast a creature spell with converted mana cost three or less, you get to investigate. So it was very important for me when I was getting the creatures in the deck that most of them triggered Bygone Bishop. And either, if they didn't, at least they got Renegade Rallyer to trigger as well. So we're looking to have all creatures with converted mana cost two or uh, three or less, essentially. So the Bygone Bishop can get advantage of it and also Renegade Rallyer can bring them back if that's the case so if we look at our deck the only creatures that are not triggered by this are Gisela essentially Gisela is the only creature that does not return from the graveyard from a renegade rallyer and it also does not trigger the bygone bishop but it is a 4-3 first striking flying lifelink so at the same turn it's, it's doing its value anyway so but maybe if we wanted to go full synergy, this is probably the creature that needs cutting. I'm not sure what we would replace it with, but, you know, we've got options, I suppose. There are a lot of auras in the game that are not in this deck, so they could go quite nicely. But, anyway, uh, we get to investigate every single time we cast a creature after Bygone Bishop lands, which gets us a clue token. The clue token is a colorless artifact that says, pay to sacrifice it, and draw a card. Yet again, sacrificing that artifact triggers revolt which allows us to draw a card and then we can also renegade rally or something back maybe that kind of thing um or even just get a counter on solemn recruit so a lot of synergies with the revolt side and a lot of synergies with the enchantment creatures that we've got into the deck as well we then have solemn recruit we have spoken upon this but we have not gone into too much detail so far two white and a one colorless we have a two two double striker that has revolt it says at the beginning of your end step very important if a permanent you control left the battlefield this turn put a 1-1 counter on solemn recruit so if we sack an unbridled growth sack a evolving wild sack a clue or even return a conviction to our hand we trigger revolt and that gets an extra counter on solemn recruit and solemn recruit can get out of hand very fast because it's doing four damage on its baseline uh, if it's unblocked, then it's doing six, and then so on and so forth. If we get a... Oops. No. If we get a Conviction or a... Oh, sorry. If we get a Nimbus Wings onto it as well to give it flying, then it's doing six, and it's flying over the top as well, which makes it really hard to deal with and can close out the game just on its own as well. So that's why we're using her there. We then have Blessed Spirits. We're only running two copies because they are kind of cool, but not important. Um, a 2 and a white for a 2-2 flyer that says whenever you cast an enchantment spell you get to put a 1-1 counter on blessed spirits. So yet again this is a flyer that can get out of hand quite quickly that benefits from enchantments being casted. So we have our really cheap enchantments, we have our convictions that we can repeatedly cast. So if we had a herald of the pantheon for 2 mana we get to stick a counter on blessed spirits that's essentially what we're doing there and then for the final one we could even leave it on the blessed spirits for that extra one power if we needed to do that 
So, yeah, you can get really out of hand with the Blessed Spirits there. And, you know, as long as your opponent's not running Flyers, he's very hard to stop, short of hard Cassie removal. We then have Heliod's Pilgrim. So for two and a white for a 1-2 creature. It says, Heliod's Pilgrim enters the battlefield. You may search your library for an aura, reveal it, and put it into your hand and shuffle your library. So the auras that we have available are Unbridled Growth, which will allow us to trigger Revolt. We also have Nimbus Wings, which we can stick on our Solemn Recruits or one of our big creatures. If Sylvan Advocate's gotten quite large, we can get a Nimbus Wings with that. We can grab Conviction so that we can trigger Revolt every single turn. If we've already got an enabler of something like Revolt or we want uh, Saram or something like that, then Conviction allows us to... We allow, we can go grab Conviction, sorry, and it allows us to trigger all of those things to get the synergies going. We can grab a Angelic Destiny and we can stick that on the... Um, Ah, oh, my brain is just shut down today. I'm sorry, guys. Heliod's Pilgrim. We can grab the Angelic Destiny and give it plus four, plus four, flying and first strike. And when it dies, we get to bounce it back to our hand anyway. So, yeah, we can really turn on a turn four clock um, with the Heliod's Pilgrim, which is pretty sweet if that is an option we want to go for. So there's lots of options that we can grab here. A lot of synergies, and it allows us to, once we've got them, keep them as well. We then have Nissa Vaswood Seer, so for 2 and a green, a 2-2 two, two legendary creature. Nissa Vaswood Seer enters the battlefield. You may search your library for a basic forest, reveal it and put it into your hand, and then shuffle your library. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, if you control 7 or more lands, exile Nissa and return her to the battlefield, transformed under her owner's control. So, she transforms into Nissa Sage Animist. With three loyalty, she gets to plus one. You can reveal the top card of your library. If it is a land, put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, put it into your hand. So, she's either land ramp or she's card advantage for a plus one, which is pretty sweet. Either one will take. Um, we've got the minus two. Put a legendary 4-4 green elemental creature token named Ashire, the Awoken World, onto the battlefield. So, this is her way of protecting ourselves. It's not really going to be too useful. Uh, not likely going to be used anyway, should I say. Uh, but if it is, that's also a target for our auras if we need a target for them. And her minus 7 ability to close out the game. Untap up to 6 target lands. They become 6-6 six, six elemental creatures and they're still lands. So we get 6-6-6s, six, six, sixes, which is pretty sweet and will kill our opponent in one shot, very likely. We then have Tireless Tracker. So for 2 and a green, a 3-2 creature. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you get to investigate. And investigate gets us the clues that we can sack to trigger revolt and draw cards. Whenever you sacrifice a clue, put a 1-1 one -one counter on Tireless Tracker. So yet again, this is a revolt enabler, but it's also card advantage and makes a big creature so that we can maybe Nimbus Wings over the top and swing in for lethal that way. This guy can get out of hand quite quickly and also refill our hand as well to get us the answers we need. So even if he is not the solution, to victory, he's going to find it for us. So it's pretty sweet. Renegade Rallyer. This is the first card that I put into this deck when I decided I wanted to go Revolt um, Splashes. So Renegade Rallyer is a one green, one white, and one colorless for a 3-2 human warrior. It has Revolt. It says, whenever Renegade Rallyer enters the battlefield, if a permanent you control left the battlefield this turn, return target permanent card with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So, the things that it can return, so let's say we trigger Revolt, we want to be landing this guy on turn 4 by the way guys, uh, because turn 4 we either have an Evolving Wilds to crack, or we have an Unbridled Growth to sack, or a Clue, that kind of thing. Either way, um, Renegade Rally is likely to come down on turn 4 for us there. But let's say we've triggered Revolt and he's come down, he can return anything with converted mana cost 2 or less. So that's a Conviction, Nimbus Wings, Sylvan Advocate, Herald of the Pantheon, Saram, and an unbridled growth, or even a land if we've sacrificed an evolving lands, oh, evolving wilds, and that will ramp us as well. So he's either ramp, um, he can pump himself up, or he gets us creatures, or he can allow us to get card advantage, that kind of thing. Either way, there is a ton of value for Renegade Rallyer to grab for her here, so that is why he's in here. And he's been doing really well from what I've been playing, so that is why we're going with him. We then have Gisela, the Broken Blade. We have spoken upon you. It's a 4-mana four 4-3 four, with Flying, First Strike, and Lifelink. Pretty much speaks for itself. It's just simply a good value creature that we can stick enchantments on if we so choose to do so. Um, 
The secondary ability is absolutely useless in this deck because we do not run Bruna. Um, maybe we want to put a Bruna in here just for funnies, but uh, right now it's just not the case. It's just going to be a 4-3 flying first strike right lifelink, which can shut down aggro decks right in their tracks if they can't remove it, so that's why we're running it. Angelic Destiny, yet again, we've touched upon this. Four mana enchantment gives plus four, plus four, flying first strike. Turns him into an angel, not that that matters. But if the enchanted creature dies, Angelic Destiny comes back to our hand so we can put it on another creature as well. Pretty awesome. We then have Isolation Zone. So for two and two white enchantment, when Isolation Zone enters the battlefield, exile target creature or enchantment and opponent controls until Isolation Zone leaves the battlefield. So... This is an enabler for removing Sphinx's tutelages because we do draw a lot of cards. So Mill can be quite the uh, the tough matchup for us. So we can remove Sphinx's tutelage thanks to the enchantment removal. We could even remove an Ulamog as well. Uh, exiling target creature gets around any kind of indestructibility or anything like that. So that's pretty sweet. So we can get rid of them like that. Uh, that's pretty much the case. Uh, if we go to the old enchantment that was on here... There's a reason why I did not run it. It is cheaper. And you guys are probably going to bring it up if I don't. So Thopter Arrest is a two and a white enchantment. It says Thopter Arrest enters the battlefield. Exile target artifact or creature. And opponent controls until it leaves the battlefield. So it's essentially isolation zone for one less. However, we don't get to exile enchantments. It's artifacts instead. And I thought to myself, what are the artifacts that I really want to remove over enchantments like game winning enchantments like uh, Sphinx's Tutelage, that kind of thing. And the only artifacts I could think of are Gear Hulks that I really want to get rid of. That and maybe a Dynavolt Tower. But for the most part, I'm more afraid of a Sphinx's Tutelage than I am a Dynavolt Tower. And if it is indeed a Gear Hulk, well, then Isolation Zone gets it anyway with a creature. So for one mana extra, I think it gets rid of a lot of the things that I'm a little bit more worried about. It's up to you guys. If you want to swap them around, you can absolutely do that, but... Uh, I've been playing around with Isolation Zone. I'm just a lot more happy with it. When I had Thopter Arrest, I got destroyed by Mill, so I really wished that the Isolate, the Thopter Arrest would have been Isolation Zones in that situation. So that's why I've decided to go with them. We then have Sigil of the Empty Throne. This is an enchantment dex win condition by all stretches. So for three and two white, we got an enchantment that says whenever you cast an enchantment spell, Put a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying onto the battlefield. So every single enchantment suddenly gets us a 4-4. So if we are playing um, Unbridled Growth, that is a 1-mana 4-4. We then have our Nimbus Wings, which gets us a 2-mana 4-4, and so on and so forth. Conviction, repeatable 4-4s at that point for 3-mana, or even 2-mana with Herald of the Pantheon down. If Herald of the Pantheon's down as well, it turns Nimbus Wings into a 1-mana 4-4 in a nutshell. And, yeah, we can really get out of hand that way, fly over the top with our Angels, and there's not much our opponent can do at that point. Even if they get past the Sigil and destroy it, we've probably got a fair few 4-4s off of it anyway, so the damage has been done at that point, which is why I kind of really like Sigil of the Empty Throne. But, yes, that's why we're running that. Before, that was the main win condition, but now we have kind of a mid-range balance of uh, big creatures and that kind of thing. We then have Aid from the Cowl. I'm very excited about this card because it works really well in this deck. So, for a 5 mana, 3 and 2 green, we've got an enchantment. It says, Revolt. At the beginning of your end step, if a permanent you control left the battlefield this turn, reveal the top card of your library. If it is a permanent card, you may put it into onto the battlefield. Otherwise, put it onto the bottom of your library. So, Aid from the Cowl. Uh, if we can trigger Revolt, so we trigger that, as I said, by sacking clues or maybe even dropping Conviction and bouncing it every single turn. If we can trigger Revolt, we get to look at the top card of our library. And if it's a permanent, we put it straight onto the battlefield. You may have noticed, I don't have a single non-permanent card in this deck which means every single time we trigger Aid from the Cowl, it is guaranteed to hit a card that will go onto the battlefield. Whether that be a land, or it be an Ajani, or even a Sigil of the Empty Throne, or even removal for one of our opponent's creatures, Aid will always hit a permanent, so long as there is a legal target for it. So the only downside might be if we find Angelic Destiny and we don't have a creature to attach it to, that kind of thing. That would be the only situation where aid would actually be a downside, but that's never happened to me so far. So aid from the cowl, 
always gets a permanent onto the battlefield. So we are either ramping or we're getting card advantage off of this guy every single turn. Because if Aid from the Cal's down, there's a good chance we can trigger Revolt every turn. Because we must have found a Conviction by that point. There's just not much chance that that's not going to be the case. So Aid from the Cal is super awesome in this deck. We then have a Jani Unyielding. So this is essentially the same kind of thing. So for four and a green and a white, we've got a four loyalty Planeswalker. He has a plus two ability. This is the ability that we really want to make use of. It says, reveal the top three cards of your library. Put all non-land permanent cards revealed this way into your hand. The rest onto the bottom of your library in any order. Yet again, only non-land permanents. So there are only tw 23 things that a Jani cannot hit off of that plus two ability. So there's a, probably a good chance that we actually get two in three of the cards off of that. So it's actually a plus two draw two in a way. We can get a lot of value off of that. I very rarely don't hit anything with the plus two ability from a Jani, which makes it super sweet. And by the time um, we've got non-land non permanents anyway, we're already at six mana, so we don't really need the lands that he might put to the bottom of his library anyway, so... You know. Anyway, a Jani can also minus two. Exile target creature, its controller gains life equal to its power. So there is a downside to it. It does gain power at uh, life off of it, but... That is a minus two to get rid of an Ulamog. It can get rid of pretty much any, op any opponent's creatures that we really don't like to see. So there is that. Our opponent does gain life, but we're going to be gaining a lot of 4-4s. Four so we can probably stabilize quite easily, even through our opponent gaining 10 life. That, that kind of thing. The minus nine ability is not really that useful to us, but it is possible. Because we are plusing two every single turn. So if we can keep it safe with our 4-4 four four angels or our uh, suited up. Sylvan Advocates, then we can get to minus nine. It says, put five plus one plus one counters on each creature you control, and five loyalty counters on each other Planeswalker you control. Ajani is the only Planeswalker, so the secondary ability is not going to actually activate, but five plus one plus one counters on every single creature we control. So depending on the amount of 4-4 four, four angels we've got, or even our tireless trackers and things like that, if we've generated a lot of little creatures, we've got 21 in the deck, so... It's very likely we've got two or three at least. That's going to be 15 power on the minus nine. And probably going to be flying as well. Gisellas, that kind of thing. If we stick counters on them, that's just going to be game over. So Johnny can end the game with the ultimate here. It's not out of the question that it's actually a good idea to do that. But I don't see it becoming that useful. I think just the card advantage, the sheer amount of card advantage that he gets from his plus two ability is good enough for an excuse to play him. So, that's essentially the deck anyway. Let's go on to the mana base, shall we? We've got nine planes and six forests. We do run more planes because of Conviction. We want to be using two white every single turn to make the uh, the repeatable thing at the very least. So, uh, we run more white than we do green just for the Conviction to trigger. But we do make up for it with dual lands and evolving wilds as well. So, dual lands wise, we've got Canopy Vista. So, that is a forest planes. Enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more basic lands. As you can see, we are running plenty of basics, so that is fine. Even if we get it down on turn one as a tap land, that's also fine because we can get Sun Petal Grove in to play untapped from a Canopy Vista. Sun Petal Grove enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a forest or a plains. So we've got our basics to make it come into play untapped, and our Canopy Vista will also do the same. We're then running four copies of Evolving Wilds. Sacking the Evolving Wilds is a um, revolt trigger, but it also thins out our deck and means that all of our card draw from things like Saram and our Unbridled Growth, less likely to hit lands, which means when we eventually get to Aid from the Cowl, it's also less likely to hit a land on there and more likely to hit an Ajani or some really big problem for our opponent. So there is that. Anyway, guys, that is going to do it for the deck. If you did like the look of it, then uh, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for some more stuff. There'll be some matches following up very shortly, if not already, for you to check out and watch it in action. Uh, be sure to hit the little bell icon as well right next to the subscription button to be notified when I release new videos. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>